Hi, dance friends. This past week, a certain dancer turned actress was quoted saying the following, seeing Ethan's feet up close for the first time, I was totally gobsmacked. We'll give you one hint here, which is that the Ethan she's referring to is legendary dancer Ethan Stiefel. So who is the dancer actress quoted? The answer at the end of this episode of the Dance Edit podcast. Hello, everyone. Happy, slightly belated International Dance Day, which we celebrated yesterday. And welcome to the Dance Edit podcast. I'm Margaret Fuhrer. I'm Courtney Escoyne. And I'm Cadence Neenan. We are editors at Dance Magazine and Dance Spirit Magazine. And in today's episode, we'll be recapping some recent dance headlines, talking about how the ballet world has succeeded and failed in expanding its pool of choreographers, discussing the spate of TV dance TV shows happening or about to happen, and hearing from phenomenal Ailey dancer and choreographer Jamar Roberts about his social disc dancing life. Um, but before we get into it, a reminder to, of course, like and subscribe and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening, um, but also to head to Instagram or Twitter to send us your suggestions for topics of dance conversation, you know, whatever your preferred social medium, we want to hear from you. And thank you to those of you who've already have sent in suggestions um, after asking for ideas last week. We had some really interesting stuff come in. So keep your... Um, you know, I was going to say keep your ears peeled. That sounds gross, <laughs> but <laughs> stay tuned. Stay tuned for those topics in future episodes. Um, and now on to our first segment, which is a quick saute through some notable dance headlines. After several weeks of what felt like a, you know, a COVID-19 news drought, there was a small flurry of notable dance news stories this past week, and we wanted to make sure we touched on them all. So Courtney, will you start us off? Yeah, so as we've covered, the Tonys have been indefinitely postponed, but the Drama Desk Awards are still going on. They're going to be announced via live stream on May 31st, and nominations have been announced. Uh, of particular note for us, obviously, are the nominees for Outstanding Choreography, Contemporary Queens Camille A. Brown and Anne Teresa de Kiersmacher, So You Think You Can Dance stalwarts Sonia Taya and Travis Wall, Broadway vet Kathleen Marshall, and the wildly versatile Keone and Mari Madrid. In the ballet world, promotion season is upon us, with San Francisco Ballet announcing its promotions for the 2021 season, which included 11 promotions, two new company members, and six apprentices. Uh, less exciting news. An artist impact survey presented by Americans for the Arts released its initial findings, and to say that the results are grim is an understatement. 95% of surveyed artists have lost income due to COVID-19, and 62% have become fully unemployed. Now, the survey was and continues to be open to artists of all stripes, so dancers only made up about 8% of respondents, but we've got a sinking feeling that a dancer-specific survey won't necessarily look much brighter. Um, the Actors' Equity Association recently hired a high-profile, and when we say high-profile, we mean like worked with Barack Obama, high-profile, safety consultant to help the union develop the necessary steps to reopen Broadway. So potentially a glimmer of hope. Oof. We need a glimmer of hope after that Americans <laughs> for the Arts study. Um so in our next segment, we wanted to talk about two recent stories that relate to the ballet world's choreographer problem, i.e. that for way too long, it has only hired cis hat white male choreographers, um, and highlight how companies both have and have not made progress on that front. Um, first, the more hopeful side of that picture. So Dance Magazine published a piece noting that recently there's been a whole wave of story-driven ballets choreographed by women, or rather that women are being asked or allowed to create that type of work. And the article gets into how their perspectives are reshaping the story ballet form. Yeah, this was a really interesting story to work on behind the scenes. Um, it kind of primarily profiled Kathy Marston, Helen Pickett, and Annabelle Lopez Achoya, um, all of whom have had really recent high profile commissions for story ballets. And we haven't seen women choreographing story ballets for a little while. Um, and it kind of the conclusion that um, the writer Jen Peter sort of came to is it's sort of a confluence of not only are companies under a lot of pressure now to at least be showing gender equity in terms of their commissions, but 
tried and true wisdom is that story ballets sell at the box office. Um, and we're kind of moving away from just getting into that, like, sort of modernism, uh, abstract work that we really saw at the beginning of the 21st century. I don't know. I personally, of course, think it's really exciting, not only seeing women telling stories, but women telling stories about strong women. I mean, I know as a English nerd and ballet nerd this summer, being able to see Kathy Marston's Jane Eyre was like a next level excitement moment for me. And seeing her telling a woman's story, you know, with really the focus on female agency and really trying to tell, you know, even platonic friendship between women, emphasizing that in her ballet, I thought was really interesting and amazing to see. Yeah, fewer sylphs and swans, more strong, complicated, interesting human women. women. Yes, yeah. Well, and, I, and I think also there tends to be a conversation about like, we need strong women. It's like, no, I don't want strong women. I want complex women. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, there was a Helen Pickett quote I really liked. Um, I'm looking for stories where the women don't have to kill themselves. They're on their feet on the earth with hard decisions to make. That. I, I think it's interesting, too, that the story pointed out that the steps themselves look different. You know, there's less emphasis on delicate traditional point work, less manipulative partnering, more equal weight sharing in pas de deux. It's moving away from the sort of patriarchal qualities that are built into parts of ballet technique. Marston even said she doesn't feel that traditional ballet vocabulary can tell these women's stories in like the way that she wants to, that she's focusing on these grounded, real human kind of movements. Mm hmm. So on the one hand, progress. On the other side of the story is an excellent New York Times piece about Robert Garland, who is a gifted black ballet choreographer. He's currently resident choreographer at Dance Theater of Harlem and director of the company school. But he's been ignored, at least for the past decade, a little longer by most other major ballet companies. And we don't want to conflate the obstacles faced by white women with those faced by black men. I mean, the majority of the women featured in the dance magazine piece are white. But it seems like even as white women gain a bit of a toehold in this part of the ballet world, talented black choreographers, ballet choreographers in particular, aren't able to break through. And we haven't even started talking about the obstacles women of color as ballet choreographers face. Right, yeah. I mean, I it's especially strange to me that New York City Ballet and other companies with Balanchine roots aren't commissioning Robert Garland. He's this acutely musical classical choreographer. He frequently brings in modern and social dance influences. It's, it's very much in the Balanchine mold. He's a part of the Balanchine lineage. Yeah, exactly. I mean, someone who learned directly from Arthur Mitchell. There's also something a little weird happening in that, you know, City Ballet in particular has recently called on black male choreographers from the modern dance world. Kyle Abraham made an incredible piece for them. Jamar, mm. who we'll talk to later, was commissioned and we'll have to wait to see that one, unfortunately. But they haven't commissioned Garland since 2000. I mean, what? There's this sort of insidious implication that black choreographers only come from the modern scene. And yet, Robert is right there, such an obvious talent, such a clear choice. It does make something of a statement about, in you know, obviously City Ballet is not the world, but right. in New York City, what we think about as Black excellence in dance, um, like, you know, like Ailey is super well entrenched and ubiquitous and beloved and fully deserves to be. But also sometimes it seems like it's like, okay, so Ailey, that's it. And there's so much more. I mean, I guess the takeaway is that, okay, the ballet world is beginning to recognize the need for diversity among its choreographers. Great. But their efforts to enlarge that pool have so far been a little bit spotty. So still much more progress yeah. to be made. And we haven't even gotten into queer representation, which is a whole other conversation. Another, another rabbit hole to go down, yeah. Um, all right. Well, in our next segment, we wanted to talk about all the dance TV shows that are happening now or are about to happen, because there, there is suddenly a lot of action on that front. Um, some of this is all too welcome news, given how hungry we are for good dance content that we can watch from a screen. Um, but some of the premises for these shows straight up boggle the mind. Um, so should we maybe progress from the least to the most bonkers show ideas? Is that a good order? <laughs> I think, think that makes sense. 
Well, probably the least bonkers and most straightforward kind of headline that we have is that World of Dance, which filmed in late winter, will be premiering May 26th. So that's super exciting to get to see some really good dance on TV soon. Yeah, from what I've heard through the grapevine, there are some really exciting dancers on the show this season. So yay. Aren't there always, though? <laughs> <laughs> they do get good people. Um, on the other hand, we're not totally sure where production for So You Think You Can Dance stands. There was kind of a mention in a Washington Post story that production has been halted for this season. So it's a little bit up in the air, it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, it, it sort of speaks to just how high the show's production values are. I mean, the fact that it's sister show, American Idol, they're trying to do the season with people singing from their living rooms. But for So You Think, that'd be impossible. I mean, the key to the show's success is putting great choreographers in a room with great dancers and making these fully realized pieces. And a huge part of it is that they do it in front of a live audience. It's not just the people at home. But you know what show does not need a live audience? It is Abby Lee Miller's new virtual dance moms show, <laughs> in which Abby Lee Miller wants kids across the country to submit their dance videos, which she will critique and then Skype in the winner. No audience needed. I think that's all we need to say about that. <laughs> and speaking of dance shows that are a little bit, you know, interesting, the new dance TV show coming to Quibi called Floored. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> Let's talk Floored. Let's talk about Floored. I, um, I, how do we, Do okay. you want to try to explain the premise? I don't. <laughs> I can try. I'm not sure I have a firm handle on it. It does not seem rooted in reality or a reality that I exist in. It's. So I think what's happening is it's featuring dance crews performing routines in competition, but they're performing them on a giant moving dance floor that literally rocks and shakes. And then periodically they're attacked with things designed to knock them over like giant disco balls. Or did I see like giant teddy bears in the trailer? Giant is cell that... phones, giant teddy bears. It Lots sounds like things. America's Best Dance Crew meets American Ninja Warrior. Is that the uh -huh. <laughs> But then it is also judged by a completely surreal guest judging panel. So Liza Koshy, Vine star, YouTube star, is the host. But she's joined by judges from the dance world like Maddie and Mackenzie Ziegler, Janelle, Janestra Adams, Wildebeest Adams. And then for all you Dancing with the Stars fans out there like myself, we got a whole lineup of Dancing with the Stars winners like Adam Rippon, Rumor Willis, and Amber Riley. So it's a real slew of people coming out there. I mean, some legit names in there. For sure. Maybe it's the quarantine content we never knew we needed. Maybe? Or maybe it's exactly as surreal as it seems right now. <laughs> it does actually seem like something that came out of my subconscious dreamscape. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Changing gears. Um, next up, we have the third installment in our Social Dis Dancing with a D series. Um, in which we ask artists from different corners of the dance world to leave us voice memos describing how they're coping with life right now. And this week we have the wonderful Jamar Roberts, who is one of Ailey's most compelling dancers and also the company's first ever resident choreographer. Um, here he is. Hello, dance edit listeners. This is Jamar Roberts, dancer and resident choreographer at the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. I'm very happy to be able to drop in here on Dance Edit and even more happy that Dance Edit is even in existence and able to continue to be in dialogue with the dance community during such challenging times. And speaking of the times, I must say that through social media, it's been so, so wonderful to see dance communities all around the world get creative and come up with solutions for how we can continue to move forward in good spirits. I believe so very much that once this is all over, we will all be a little bit more informed about who we are, where we live, what our needs are and what is really, really important to us. And hopefully we can start to bring those ideas and those conversations into the work that we do moving forward. For me, I can say that one of the hardest things that um, I've been dealing with is that I had two major commissions planned. I was already in the swing of things, getting steps together, solidifying, you know, things with my creative team. And then suddenly, boom, everything was brought to a halt and then postponed. 
So that's been a bummer. But the silver lining is that when it is time to get back into the studio, I will be beyond prepared. And for me, preparedness is just so essential to making good dance. But what is bringing me absolute joy right now is TV. Uh, fun fact, I have not owned a TV in probably over eight years or so now. Um, I generally prefer a good book. Staring at a screen for hours generally makes me feel kind of guilty for not working on the more important things. But since I have so much time on my hands right now, my relationship to TV and streaming services has shifted dramatically. And for the better, I might add. So TV's great, which I'm sure you all know, I'm just still stuck in the past. So um, thanks, TV. <laughs> anyway, thanks so much for listening. Try not to worry too much. You know, dance people work really, really hard. So if anything, we can all use this moment to just get some rest. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much for that, Jamar. And we, I think we'd all happily listen to your ASMR channel, Jam ASMR. <laughs> that would be lovely. <laughs> um, we should also mention that Jamar's recent piece for Ailey called Ode will be streaming on Ailey All Access for a week um, beginning today. Please watch it. It's kind of a, a meditation on the effects of gun violence. And, you know, some dances make you think and some dances make you ugly face cry and this dance did both for me, at least. I, I would say for sure, make sure you have Kleenex nearby and maybe also just a notebook to try to work out how he created something this gorgeous and this heartbreaking all at once. Yeah, the set is gorgeous, too. Just worth a watch. So before we sign off this week, here is the answer to our quote quiz from the top of the episode. This past week, a dancer turned actress said the following, seeing Ethan's feet up close for the first time, I was totally gobsmacked. And we've already told you that the Ethan she's referring to is ballet icon Ethan Stiefel. So which dancer actress was undone by Stiefel's banana feet? Amanda, Amanda Schall. Amanda Schall, aka Jodie Sawyer, who first saw said feet on the set of Center Stage, which is about to celebrate its 20th anniversary. That is How so crazy. <laughs> I, know. I I have never felt older, and yet it also feels like zero time has passed. It's truly surreal. Um, the quote was from a story that we're going to be discussing at length on ne next week's episode. Um, stay tuned for that. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We will be back next week for more discussion of all the news that's moving the dance world. Um, be sure to sign up for the Daily Dance Edit newsletter at thedanceedit.com. And don't forget to send us your suggestions for dance conversation topics. We'd love to hear them. Keep dancing, everyone. Bye. Bye. The Dance Edit Podcast is a product of Dance Media, publisher of Dance Magazine, Dance Spirit, Point, Dance Teacher, Dance Business Weekly, and the Dance Edit Newsletter. Our hosts are Courtney Escoyne, Margaret Fuhrer, Lydia Murray, and Cadence Neenan. Our music is by Celestine, with special thanks to Broadway Dance Center for helping us record those footfall sounds. Find out more about The Dance Edit and subscribe to our daily newsletter at thedanceedit.com. Thank you.